Why does the fulfillment of the entire Messianic program have to take place at one short period of time? Who is to say that the Messianic program can't begin at one point, take a pause, take a break, and pick up somewhere else? Why are the Jewish people so convinced that that is not the case? Very simple. People who propose such a theory, people who propose a theory of a dual coming, first coming and a second coming of the Messiah, historically have never done so on the basis of raw scriptural study. In other words, it never happened that people were studying the scriptures and they came up, hey, it says over here that the Messiah has to come twice. Whenever anyone came up with this theory in the history of mankind, it has always been with a specific candidate in mind. And what they're trying to do is they're saying this candidate, who hasn't accomplished what the Messiah is supposed to accomplish, is going to in the future accomplish what the Messiah is supposed to accomplish. And therefore, we should be giving him our loyalty and our devotion and our honor because of what he's going to accomplish. Basically, it's a request for credit. It's a request for credit for something that he hasn't yet done. Now, the fact that this theory has only been produced upon the failure of a Messianic program discredits it in and of itself. But it's more than that. The whole the entire request for our loyalty, for our hearts, is misunderstood. The premise seems to be is if a person has a title Messiah, then he gets our heart, he gets our devotion, he gets our loyalty. But that's not how it works. In fact, the entire concept of a king in Judaism is something which was seen as in a negative light. When the Jewish people originally asked for a king in the time of Saul, God was upset. He said, God is your king. It's only after David was introduced to, to the Jewish people, that's when a king is positive. What happened? What changed when David came on the scene? Very simple. The Jewish people have a mission. They have a calling. Part of being a chosen nation means you have a yearning. You're looking forward to something. You're, looking, you're hoping for something. You're trying to accomplish something. What is that something? That something is, in short, that we're looking forward to a time when all of the world will accept the sovereignty of God, will be living in complete harmony and brotherhood under the law, under the rule of God. Now, the truth is, in a certain sense, the Messianic program is split into two because we had a king. We had a King David, who is an anointed of God. In other words, he is God's Messiah. And he has our hearts. How does he have our hearts? It's very simple. He's singing the song that already exists in our hearts, the song, the yearning that exists in the hearts of Jewish people to have all of mankind submit, submit to God's sovereignty. That's expressed in the song of David, and that's the song that already exists in the heart of the Jewish people. And that's why he has our loyalty. It's not a loyalty to the man, it's a loyalty to the mission. You never have to argue for the loyalty for the heart of the Jewish people. If you are moving mankind towards that goal, towards the goal of bringing all of mankind into a utopian era, an era of peace, an era of brotherhood, an era of when everyone respects each other, mutual respect, and living under, with a clear recognition of God's sovereignty, you will have the, the, the loyalty and the respect of the Jewish people. If you didn't do that, you won't have their respect. To not do that, in other words, a candidate comes along, he didn't produce the goods, and he wants our loyalty, we're not going to give it to him. It, he doesn't deserve it. It doesn't belong to him. And that is why we cannot accept a, a theory of the Messiah coming twice. It's not so much that we can't accept the theory, but what the theory is arguing for, which is our heart and our loyalty, to be given to someone who didn't produce the goods yet, we can't give that to him.